Okay, so now there's one last application that we want to look at in chapter seven, our introduction to the normal distribution. And so what's happening here is that under certain conditions, uh, we may find ourselves actually using the binomial distribution, but we may find that the number of probabilities that we have to calculate is very large, which would be very time consuming. And so under certain conditions, we may be able to use the normal distribution as an approximation to the binomial distribution. Now, before we start, I just want to show you a graph which will help explain why we can do this. So first, let me draw out a histogram for the binomial distribution where we have a probability of success of 0.5. And we've seen this before. And it looks something like this. So what I would like to point out here is that and this would be X and this would be the probability of X. If we keep increasing the number of categories uh, and we have more and more possible values of X, what starts to happen is that the distribution starts to look very much like the normal distribution, now it's not perfect, but it's getting pretty close. And you can imagine as we keep increasing the number of bars, the two will start to look very, very close to each other. So it turns out that if we keep increasing the number of trials in the limit, uh, eventually the binomial distribution will converge to the normal distribution. So that means that what we're doing here is trying to use the uh, normal distribution to approximate the binomial and um, it works pretty well, depending on a number of trials and the probability of success. So for example, imagine we have a scenario where we have been de um, determined from experience that 8% of all people have type AB positive blood. Now this doesn't sound like a binomial um, trial, except for one thing. We can take all the blood types and categorize them as AB positive and all the rest. So in other words, even though there's more than two blood types, we can still get away with using the binomial distribution here because if we think of this as our success and this is our failure, there's still only two possible outcomes. Now here, the experiment consists of simply observing each person's blood type. We have a class of 60 students. Each of them could be considered a trial of an experiment. And on each trial, meaning each student, either they're AB positive or they are not. We can also assume that unless they're related to each other somehow, the trials themselves are independent of each other. In other words, um, the probability of two people having the same blood type, uh, it, 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 or at least this probability of people having a certain blood type is the same, uh, no matter who's in the room, as long as we have um, a group of students if we assume that they're not related to each other, then um, there's no independence between the probability of each one having a particular blood type. And so again, we can think of this as a trial where there's only two outcomes, AB positive and not AB positive. So we can go ahead and use the binomial distribution to calculate any probabilities that we need in a case like this. All right, so this is very much like the problems we did in chapter six. So here we're being told that 8% of AB positive blood, so pi, the probability of success would be defined as 0.08. And there's 60 students in the class. Each one could be considered a trial of an experiment and is therefore 60. And that's all we need to know to calculate the probability that a given number of students has type AB positive blood. Now, here's what we're interested in. What if we need, wanted to know, for example, the probability, not of a single number of students having AB positive blood, but let's say what we're after is the probability that the number is between three and seven. <clears throat> That's a perfectly valid question. The probability that in a class of 60, there will be between three and seven with type AB positive blood. Now, of course, we know how that would work. We'd apply the binomial distribution to each of these probabilities. 
all the way out to seven. And that would certainly work. Now, the only problem is, of course, that's a lot of calculations. We have to calculate five different probabilities and then add them up. Now, of course, in this day and age with our special calculators and uh, Excel and all the rest, it's not as big of a deal as it would have been at one time. But it's nice to know that what we could actually do is replace all those calculations with a single normal probability and we'll get a number which should be reasonably close to the correct value. Now, the first thing we have to do though, is we can't just go ahead and start calculating probabilities from the normal distribution. We have to take some steps um, to improve the likelihood that a result is highly accurate. So the first thing we're gonna do is use something called the continuity correction. Now, what we're essentially doing is adjusting the interval of interest. And in a nutshell, what you're doing is you're adding a half to the upper limit of our interval. And subtract a half from the lower limit. Now you're probably asking, why are we doing this? It's a very good question because it has been shown from experience that this does improve the approximation. That's the only reason. There's no theoretical reason for it. It just has been shown from experience that this does help improve the approximation. So um, remember, statistics is a very practical science. We're trying to find results that make sense. And so um, we always have to allow for a little bit of gray area to get the results that we need. And so here, what we're doing is saying, well, listen, if we widen the interval just a bit, that should help improve the approximation. So this process is known as the continuity correction, which means that you're correcting for the fact that you're trying to use a continuous distribution, the normal that is, in place of a discrete distribution, the binomial distribution. And, you know, when I was drawing that picture, let me just go back and revisit that. You could see no matter how many bars I have in my histogram, it will never perfectly replicate the normal curve. No matter how many bars there are, there's always going to be some discrepancies. So in other words, Here, in some cases, the curve is above the bars. In some cases, the bars are above the curves. So we're basically trying to fill in, eliminate these errors, or at least reduce them as much as possible when we calculate uh, or when we use the continuity correction. Now, I do want to point out, though, that if one of our intervals is infinity or negative infinity, um, or one of the limits, I should say, then we don't bother with this, okay? In other words, it doesn't make any sense to add a half to infinity or subtract a half from negative infinity. Only if these are constants do we use the continuity correction, okay? So if we had something like this, x less than or equal to seven, uh, or let's, let's write it like this. then when you apply the continuity correction, you would only add a, the, a half to the upper limit. There's no point in subtracting a half from uh, negative infinity, okay? But for constants like three, four or five, whatever the case may be, what you would do is you would add a half to the upper limit and subtract a half from the lower limit. Now, one of the things we have to watch out for though, is that as you know, the normal distribution is continuous. It cannot be used to calculate the probability of a single value. So what if we have our binomial distribution and we need to know the probability that x equals three? I can't do that directly with the continuous distribution. So the way I work around that is to add and subtract a half from that three so that instead of three, I have the range between two and a half and three and a half. All right, so in other words, if you run into that strange case where you need the probability of a single value, then what you can do is just create that interval around it and you'll get your result. Now, 
In that case, though, you might not bother with the normal approximation because you're not really saving any time. But if you do want to use it anyway, then this is how it would be done. All right, so for that example um, with the students in the class, we're trying to figure out the probability that in a class size of 60, that between three and seven of them have type AB positive blood. So what we're gonna do after the continuity correction is applied is it's gonna become the interval between two and a half and seven and a half. So we subtract a half from the lower limit, add a half to the upper limit. So what that means is this is what we're going to calculate the probability of. Not the original one. Because this one will give us a slightly better answer. With the understanding that no matter what we do, it's going to be slightly inaccurate. All right, now that was the first part. Now the next thing we want to remember is that in order to calculate standard normal probabilities from the, the Z table, You'll recall that we previously were using this transformation formula, z equals x minus mu over sigma. We're going to do the same thing here, except if you notice, because x is actually a binomial uh, random variable, if you recall the shortcuts or moments for the shortcuts, the moments of the binomial distribution, the expected value which is the same thing as mu, was n times pi. The standard deviation was the square root of n pi 1 minus pi. So z equals x minus mu over sigma. In this case, we replace the mu with n pi, and we replace the sigma with the square root of n pi 1 minus pi. but it's the same procedure. It just so happens that we have access to those moments. And so we may as well take advantage of them. And so now this way, if you want to calculate your probability with a table, you can do so. You, you don't have to. If you use the calculators, um, then this will prove not to be necessary. Well, all right then, let's do this. Now for the case of the students in the class with AB positive blood, Remember, there were 60 students, of which 8% um, have the type AB positive. So that means because X, the number of students with AB positive is the, is the variable that we're studying. Um, it is a binomial random variable. Its expected value or mean is therefore n times pi, 60 times 0.08, which is 4.8, which means in a class of the size on average, we should get 4.8 students with type AB positive. And then the standard deviation, as you can see when we plug in the numbers, it's approximately 2.101. Okay, so those are our moments. So now, no matter what probability we want, and we're gonna now essentially pretend that um, X is normal, So in order to convert these into standard normal random variables, we need to subtract four and a half and divide by 2.101. So that interval that we just created, after applying the continuity correction, we subtract the 4.8, divide by 2.101 in both cases. And then this turns out to be approximately negative 1.09 up to 1.29. If you're using the tables, you must round these to two places after the decimal point. Now, you recall how we handled these types of in-between probabilities. These are not directly on the table. doesn't matter because all we have to do 
is subtract the smaller one from the larger one. Both of these are on the table, All right? One, of course, is on the positive table, one is on the negative table. So um, you can see if we go to the positive table, 1.29 can be found at the intersection of 1.2 and 0.09. <clears throat> and that will be... Oh, wait a minute, it does, I don't have it far enough over there. Point 0.9015, which it's already here, of course, and then negative 1.09. And of course, we go to the negative table for that one. We look for the intersection of negative 1.0 combined with 0 0.09. And that's here, 1379. And so when you subtract, you end up with 0.7636. And that's your answer, okay? Now, you're probably wondering, what if we had done this directly with the binomial distribution? Oh, good question. What would we have gotten? The exact answer is 0.7639. Taken from the binomial distribution instead of the, appro the um, approximate value is 0.76, as you, we just saw, 39, not uh, 36 rather. Not bad, not bad at all, considering how much time we saved. Now, what if we'd chosen to use our calculators? Okay, now if you're using the calculators, you don't really have to convert into the standard normal form. Okay, so let's see what would have been different. You still have to do the continuity correction because that, that has nothing to do with the normal distribution. Um, using the TI-84, remember when you go to the TI-84, and I have the simulated ones here. By the way, I posted the solutions uh, or the steps rather for finding this and using it yourself if you choose to do so. You don't have to. But what you need is second VARs, number two CDF. Now, in this case, remember um, what we had was the probability being between two and a half and seven and a half after applying the continuity correction. So now again, we're treating this as a normal random variable where X, the expected value of X rather is 4.8 and the standard deviation is approximately 2.101. So what you would have to do is come back here and for your lower limit, 2.5, your, your upper limit is 7.5. The mean, the zero is replaced with the 4.8 that we just calculated. And the standard deviation would be replaced with 2.101. Yeah, this, uh, I'm starting, <laughs> I'm losing a little bit of my 
amazement over this thing. It's really giving me a hard time with the typing. I, I was hoping for better than this. You know, it's really giving me a tough time typing it properly. All right, I guess if you're willing to put up with it. So what I wanted to do is take a picture of this. Yeah, well, that whole time it just kept disobeying what I was doing. But that might be the, my keyboard rather than the uh, software. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Technology has a way of letting me down. All right, and you can see, oh, well, what you can't see is because I didn't type in the answer yet. Um, I didn't ask it to paste. Twice, 0 0.07638 or 0 0.7638. Now, if you notice, the tables gave us 7636. The actual value is 7639. The calculator is giving us 7638. There's always there's always a potential um, for a slight difference between the tables and the calculator. It's because of the rounding. Okay, so don't um, be too concerned about that unless it's way off. It's not unusual that the two are slightly different because of rounding issues, but either way, they're both very close to the actual answer. Now, by the way, uh, as a rule of thumb, this is sort of like how we know if the normal approximation is likely to work well or not. If the number of trials times pi is at least five, here it's only about 4.8, so it's, it's cutting it a little close here. Um, here we don't have to worry about it. It's 60 times 0. 0.92. 55.2, yeah. So <laughs> we only got a little close to this first condition. So in other words, what it's telling us is that even here, it should work reasonably well. And it does. We saw it happen. Uh, so, you know, we usually, um, this approximation works pretty well, but if if you don't follow these uh, two rules, n pi greater than or equal to 5, n times 1 minus pi greater than or equal to 5, we might find that it's not working as well. Now, again, you know, in this day and age, this is not really saving us a huge amount of time, but you'll see that we need this framework for what's coming up in the next chapters. In other words, the idea that uh, a normal random variable and a binomial are very close to each other, at least in the limit, is a very important idea. So even if we don't really need this approximation, um, the logic behind what we did is going to be very useful. But anyway, having said all that, using the same example, we've got, remember, N is 60 students. Each is considered a trial, an independent trial, with a likelihood of 8% of getting type AB positive. We want to know the probability that no more than six students have type AB positive blood. That would be this. Okay, now, in terms of probabilities, even though technically you can't have negative numbers of students, what we're doing is treating these numbers as if they were um, standard deviations below the mean rather than actual numbers of students. So what we're going to do is write this as okay, because um, while we can't have a negative infinity number of students, we can have a very small number of standard deviations or many standard deviations below the mean. 
So the continuity correction here will ask us to only change one of these two, and that would be the upper limit because it's a constant. Now, um, we don't change the expected value or the standard deviation. We still have these values. So you can now use the conversion to use the standard normal table for this. And you'll get Z is less than or equal to 0 0.81, approximately. And um, if you go to the normal table, you'll see that that's uh, right there, 0 0.79. Now, it turns out that in this case, the approximate, the actual uh, probability is 79.80, which is, again, not too bad. If I want to use the TI-84, of course, we'll go back to the simulator and second vars normal. This time we'll have lower limit. Now remember when this calculator, negative infinity is negative second, sorry, negative second comma 99. In this case, the upper was six and a half. And these don't change. Let me sneak these into the uh, slides. And let's let it tell us what the probability is. And it'll be slightly different than what we got with the tables, of course. Oh, what did I do? I'm sure I hit the wrong key. This would never happen on the actual physical calculator. Um, Oh, that's bad. Um, it seems to be stubborn with me today. What did I do? Oh, you know what? I, I bet I know what happened. I think that what probably happened was I used my keyboard for this negative. It wants this one. And I think it's very sensitive to that. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, you know what I... All right, let's do that all over again. Negative second comma 99. I, I bet that will work. And this is the kind of thing that could happen to you too. Um, so you have to keep an eye on that. Yeah, okay. 0. 0.7908. This, these are the kinds of things you have to find out. What can go wrong? That's a hugely important piece of information with any software or technology. What can go wrong? All right. So it's 7908. And, you know, it's off again, but it's not that far off. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. Slightly different than what we got from the tables, which is what we pr pretty much expect. And now, 
we've got one more of these. So at least four. Okay. So basically, think of this as everything from four up to infinity. Again, infinity, not in the sense of infinitely many students in the class, but an infinite number of standard deviations above the mean. So the continuity correction will only affect the lower limit. So if you convert this with the um, formula, so you can use the tables. Okay, you subtract as always 4.8 divided by 2.11. This is the probability of being at least negative 0.62, which we know equals one minus the probability of negative 0.62. And then you go to your table So you look for the negative 0.6 combined with 0.02 in the negative table, that is. Twenty six seventy six. OK. We subtract that from one, of course, because it's actually greater than we want less than. Uh, I mean, it that shows less than we want greater than. Um, it's approximately 7324 using the tables, okay? It turns out the actual value is 0 0.7171. So again, you can see it's getting off a little bit. Um, and now, of course, using the table, the calculator. All right, so we need everything from 3.5 up to infinity. Let's go back to the calculator. Second bars, number two. Um, let me just double check. It was 3.5, right? Yeah, 3.5. See, this is where I, you got to really watch this thing. It's fun, but I wouldn't use it instead of my actual calculator. That's for sure. Second comma, 99. Okay, enter, enter, 73.20, let's say. Oh, look what I did. I, I did not save the part that I wanted to save. Here it is, here it is. Um, okay, so yeah, let's run it again. Seven three, let's round it to seventy three twenty. Okay, so again, it's not perfect, but um, it's it's not too terrible either. I mean, it's not way off. But um, again, we have to expect a certain amount of inaccuracy considering what we're doing. We're trying to use a discrete distribution or use a continuous distribution as an approximation to a um, discrete. So there's bound to be some errors. But again, now imagine this is like back in the day when there was no calculators, <clears throat> there's no Excel, there's no computers. This um, had the potential to be a huge time saver. And like I said, um, what we've done is we're going to be showing up in uh, the next chapter, at least, as um, part of the process that we'll be following. 
By the way, um, you also could, in principle, use the normal distribution to approximate the Poisson, but we're not going to do that here. The approximation isn't quite as good. The two distributions aren't quite as closely related to each other, but um, it can be done. And in fact, in principle, you could use the normal distribution for any discrete distribution, but you'd have to meet certain conditions before it, um, it would be accurate. So anyway, so that's ch chapter seven. Now, I did say that chapter seven may be the most important one in the whole course because we're using the normal distribution, which you'll see more often by a long shot than any of the others throughout this course and uh, what follows. So what's coming up in chapter eight is we're going to be using the normal distribution in a different way. We're going to be analyzing the properties of samples again. We're going to revisit the concept of samples, which is such an important part of statistics. Um, samples themselves have a lot of interesting properties. And it turns out that we'll be able to, under certain conditions, use our normal distribution to calculate probabilities for sample means. In other words, imagine myself choosing a sample of students and calculating the probability that their average GPA is at least 3.6 or something like that. That's what's going to happen in the next chapter. And everything we do there will be related to what we're seeing here. Okay, the calculations will be similar. We'll be using the normal distribution. We can use these wonderful calculators. But um, we do have to introduce some very important ideas as well. So I uh, see that we are done completely here with chapter seven. So we'll stop right now. And when we meet again, we'll introduce chapter eight, which is called sampling distributions. So I'll see you then.